Hello and welcome to the Hoop Collective Podcast. We talk about the NBA, which we're doing on Sunday evening, a little bit later for this gentleman who is making his first appearance on the Hoop Collective. We're happy to have him. Now, Ryan Rucco, this you have to be on camera for this whole thing. I know that you're used to you know, doing it for like right at the beginning and then hiding behind. <laughs> we don't get to see your beautiful suits, but for like a minute and a half a game. Yeah. But uh, play by play TV man extraordinaire does NBA does does NBA for ESPN and for the, the uh, Nets for yes does college basketball uh, for our, for ESPN our lead college uh, women's college basketball um, uh, play by play guy I'm sure you're looking forward Ruko to that big final four coming up in Cleveland I know you've you can't wait for four or five days in Cleveland in April. Boy, it's going to be great. <laughs> WNBA, our man on the WNBA, and New York Yankees. Ryan Rucco, welcome to Collective. What am I forgetting? What am I forgetting the, on your plate? The only thing you're forgetting, and thank you, Bri, is what a massive fan of the Hoop Collective I am. And I and I told Tim Bontemps um, a, a, a couple months ago, we had, we had gone to dinner uh, after a, a broadcast, I don't even he know went where to dinner we with were. Him, McMahon. Oh, yeah. I haven't introduced him yet. Never mind. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, and and I said, you know, that's a that's a bucket list item for me. And he was like, mm. what? I was like, yeah, I listen to the Hoop Collective all the time. So I think you guys really endeared yourselves to me when you properly detailed how awful the Denver airport is. And <laughs> ever since then, I've just been a diehard fan. So thank you guys for having me. And hey, and what he's done, McMahon, is he's replaced Bontemps. So that's, <laughs> yes. I mean, talk, that's a bucket list for us. Joining us from Dallas, <laughs> Texas, where Ruko made the call of the Kyrie Irving 20-foot left-handed hook shot wearing a beautiful green St. Patrick's Day suit <laughs> is Ben McMahon. Howdy, partners. Hey, anybody who replaces Bomb Temps has already endeared themselves to me. Wendy, get this. You know, I'm kind of like Pace Picante sauce. I have a very Texan flavor, but I was actually made in New York. So, <laughs> um, true story. He, Ruko went to high school in Terrytown, New York, the birthplace of me. So there's wow. already already a connection here. That this is true. We both, we both hate the Denver airport and think <laughs> Cleveland's a terrible place to go on vacation. Well, no, hey, I got nothing bad to say about Cleveland. And I, Bri, I'm going to be hitting you up for restaurant recommendations, but the rest is true. Well, that's not what he was saying. Off, he was telling me how awful he thinks Cleveland is. Well, that your Terrytown roots are the only thing that you and Ruko are alike in, basically. I'm just going to leave it at that. Ryan, I have uh, similar barber. That's true. <laughs> So what is an average week for you like right now with the NCAA tournament going on and obviously full bore NBA going on? Um, like, what are you doing for the next couple of weeks? And, and also uh, my two and a half year old daughter having a sleep regression right in the middle of this oh, as well, Brian. Perfect. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was, it, it's been excellent. Then get out on that road, Ryan, get out on that road. <laughs> That's right. You That's know what? why I like Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I like anywhere right now. No, I, I feel, but I get overwhelmed with guilt. So then when I'm home, I'm, I turn on the afterburners for, for, for all tasks. Um, but I right now, March is crazy. And, and I've been in the thick where I just had a 20-day stretch where every single day I was either doing an event or traveling for the event. Um, and, uh, and, I, and my only respite was because I decided to travel day of for a couple cities. But I love it. I, I, I really do. It, this time of year is always my busiest time of year because it merges my NBA slate on ESPN, my Nets slate on Yes, which actually ramps up because of Ian Eagle doing the men's tournament. And he does the early rounds as well, whereas I jump in the women's tournament at the Sweet 16. And then it also merges Yankee spring training, mm. where I just did five games over the last uh, week and a half. And then the women's tournament eventually. And the women's tournament for me is the most labor intensive, focus oriented thing that I do to the point that even though I love my job, I've wanted to be a play by play guy since I was nine years old. But when I get done with the women's tournament, I feel totally drained. There's just there's just an added level of of concentration and focus and attention around everything. So it's, um, it's kind of this, 
like very, very, very busy run up until this incredibly uh, awesome crescendo that kind of takes everything out of me. And then I try and recharge for a week before we have NBA playoffs. I want, I want to talk about two trends in college basketball that are, that are interesting. Oh, he's got okay. the balloons up. The little zoom balloons just popped up. I like yeah, they did. Was that, that a, was that I'm intentional? Sure. I don't. I, I, I didn't touch anything. Trust me. I don't know. I don't know. That, that was a, that was amazing, Brian. Just zoom, was, zoom balloons popping up. It's on, a party, on baby. Screen. You know how it might, my my sunny disposition. Um, <laughs> two things. One, this trend, and I don't know. I I don't know where it started. I know mm-hmm. that. Uh, I know last year Kevin Harlan, our uh, our a friend of the pod, who uh, made that one call that upset in the first round where. They now put the camera on the play-by-play uh, yeah. <laughs> booth in the tournament because they want instantaneous, like they want video of you reacting. So now you don't just have to deliver the sound, but you know that if it's like really good, they're going to show that immediately on camera. This seems to me to be <laughs> a new element into the, like, I don't think... I don't think Stan Van Gundy is is down for this, but <laughs> this is a new element to the play by play booth. I, I I don't know. Is this something that you welcome? I seem to remember Adam Amin when he was still with us calling the women's tournament a few yeah. years ago. There was a big shot, and I'm sorry I don't remember the chapter and verse of the big shot. Like it was Enrique Agumbawale and her game winners for Notre Dame in the semis okay. and the finals. Yeah, with Carol Lawson and Rebecca Lobo. Yeah. It, what this seems like it's High pressure, Ryan. My God. <laughs> you know what? What's funny is I th- we have a Snoop cam. We call it the Snoop cam. Sure is. And, and, and it really is. And we do have one. We have not used it yet on air. And I haven't even seen it back from any of my calls in the women's tournament. But I would be fascinated to see it. The first year I did the tournament, we had some wild finishes with uh, – Arizona and Stanford and South Carolina. Um, and last year, you know, we had Caitlin's run up until the championship game and LSU winning. I, it, the the funny thing is, like, I do ridiculous stuff because you get you, you get your whole body into the call. Like yes, someone, we saw you when, you, when Kyrie Patrick I mean, that was, yeah. became <laughs> famous. You and Patrick Mahomes side by side. Yeah, yeah like you really do. So I, I don't think anything would ever make me consciously think like, oh, they could show this. But I, I would almost just for my own entertainment be fascinated to see like, what was I doing <laughs> at this moment? There A couple of years ago, do you guys remember the game that the Nets came back against the Kings? They were down 25 to start There's the fourth no quarter. There's no chance I remember this game. This was D, D'Lo scored, uh, I think he scored 20, 27 or 28 in the fourth quarter. I'm like, I'm like Wendy when he, when he was eating his omelet with Jamal Mosley. I'm going to nod my head. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Anyway, I just, I, I'm I usually never up. miss a Kings Nets game, so I can't I, believe I, I don't remember. I, I know, especially if you're on the, you know, if you're on East Coast time, staying up for those babies. So I, I, I'm like, I'm standing up, getting into it. It's the biggest comeback of franchise. And Aaron Harris, the Nets PR director, who you guys both know, he he's turning at me, just like laughing at me. As <laughs> he's like, "Sit down." I'm like, "This, this is how one I out of eighty two, Ruko. Jeez, yeah, no, this is how I had to get my body into Listen, it. So, man, nobody wants to hear if if the play by play man's not excited by the game. Who the hell wants to listen? Hey, listen, watch? I yeah, know he's got to deliver that's vocally. It. I just that's didn't know it. he had to perform like he was on stage. Um, I will say uh, I did dip my toe into college basketball over the weekend. Yes, McMahon. Oh, the hoop collective jinx is what happened. Uh, Go on. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. I I went to see my buddies on with the Duquesne Dukes, um, on a Saturday night. And unfortunately I will tell you this. I don't know anything about college basketball. I will tell you that right now. I know nothing. I don't pretend to know anything. Don't pay any attention to what I'm about to say. Okay. I've seen Illinois play twice in the last week. They're good. Illinois is freaking good. And they, ne- unfortunately for the Dukes, they were never in the game on Saturday night. But, and I also uh, watched um, Iowa State um, play against Washington State, and I have no notes on that game. There's, <laughs> there's literally nothing I can tell you about that. But here's what I'm going to tell you about the NCAA tournament. And I've been to many NCAA tournament games over the years. And maybe I just, my memory is flawed. And maybe <laughs> my, uh, you know, I'm just not remembering. Maybe I'm just getting old. Bro, 
26 minute half times. That's a lot. You mm. gotta be kidding me. No, that that that's high school. 26 minute half time. I mean, you know, that that that's a homecoming thing in high school football where you get freaking. Oh homes my and stuff. god. Yeah, that that's a that's extreme. I mean, like, you know, first off in the NBA, what is it like 17, 18 minutes? I think it's 12. No, it? yeah, it's less. Yeah. Uh, okay. or 15. And they and, and the refs are starting it before they're walking off the court. Yeah. Like, I'm like, okay. Let's go, guys. And I look up, and there's 18 on the clock. I'm like, no, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, you don't want that. That's too much. That's too 15, much. 15, Jackson. 15. 15. All right. Well, it's like, it feel, it's like probably like 18 or so in real time. And here's the thing, guys. Like, there's a bunch of other NCAA games going on, so, like, they can put those on the scoreboard. But, no. <laughs> we have to watch, and I – well, I'm not going to say that – we have to watch <laughs> NCAA propaganda ads on the scoreboard for seven to 12 minutes before we can watch and see whether Oakland is pulling off another upset. Okay. Oh man. Jeez, I, oh man. You, you know, I'm going to have to, I feel like our half times are shorter on the women's side of things. Well, like God I, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be paying attention to this. Well, no. Listen, I know they got to pay for it. I know that yeah. uh, we run ads. I, I, I get it. I, I, I'm just saying, though, from a fan experience, it's brutal. No, that's a long time. All right. Second trend in college basketball. <laughs> I know we talked about the NBA, but bear with me. We got Ryan. We'll on. get there. Yeah. Caitlin Clark. Yeah. Now, I live in Caitlin Clark land out in the middle of the country. Uh, I thought one really cool thing that I saw this weekend, I watched um, their uh, game, her first game for a while uh, against uh, Holy Cross. Um they they put a sticker or a decal down on the court yeah. at Carver Hawkeye Arena where she was when she hit the three pointer that broke the scoring record, which was way out, like 28 out there. 30 yeah. feet way out there. And so there's this little sticker that says 22 Clark. One of the coolest things I heard all weekend was that so many teams that have come through the arena, like visiting teams and like teams that were there for the NCAA tournament quadrant that was there this week have shot from that spot yeah. yeah, or like gone to the spot for photos that they, that the sticker wore off. <laughs> it's only been a, a couple weeks and they had to put down a new sticker. Now, what I think this says, Ryan, is that in real time, she is a icon within her sport. We just don't see yes. that in anything. Like, you know, there was a girl from all the cross who literally punched her in the face yesterday. Oh my gosh, yeah. I know. Yes. You got a flagrant yeah. for it. And then I don't remember yeah. the girl's name, but then she laughed after it's a flagrant. Like, I'm sure, like, not everybody loves her. Like, I remember yeah. my experience on something like this was uh, during Lynn Sanity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was covering the Heat back then. And I think one of the games where he hit the game winner at the buzzer, which I think was in Toronto, if I'm not it mistaken. It was. Yes. Um, yeah, you were in New York. You remember yeah. every single yeah. back page cover. Yeah. Oh, sure. my goodness. I remember the conversations walking into restaurants. Everybody's talking about Linsanity. It was unbelievable. Right. Yeah. So Linsanity was absolutely sh shorter than Clark's Sanity. But <laughs> I remember the heat after a game watching the end of that game in Toronto in their locker room. Mm -hmm. And when Lynn hit that three to win the game, the heat players were like falling out. They were like enjoying it. Like they're like, can you believe this? Yeah. This is amazing. Look at this guy. You know, like they were like genuinely like celebrating in the moment of a peer. Mm -hmm. Like 10, 15 days later, when Jeremy Lynn came into Miami to play, they wanted to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> I've never almost ever seen I, I would argue that Lynn Sanity died that night. Now he ended up hurting his knee, but the heat defended Jeremy Lin in the first quarter of that game like it was overtime in game seven of the finals. They it they were attacking him so much that they were hyperventilating and Spolster had to call timeout to let them rest in the <laughs> halfway through the first quarter. All right, we're off on a sidelight here. But I wonder if having witnessed Caitlin Clark's sanity uh, yeah. up front, if you could say what that's been like these last few months. It's incredible. And, and Bri, I heard uh, my colleague and good friend, Holly Rowe, telling that story, too, about the logo. And it's, it, 
does speak to the how she's in real time. Caitlin Holly, a, a legend as well, but how Caitlin in in real time has become this icon, and and I can even notice it just in the covering her games because last year covering her games, there was a feeling of this player's amazing. It's a phenomenon, and it's it's starting to you know it's it's starting to really burst and bubble this year it feels like you are around a big time celebrity just in the sense of and you know this from having been around lebron as long as you have bry how you can tell at every moment every single eye is on her if you're if you're in the arena at a shoot around if you're in a room with you know 10 people doing an interview if you're at the game Every eye is on her, and you can feel that. And so I think that she could feel it as well. I think she handles it wonderfully. I do think there's a curiosity and a fascination about her from other players in the game as well, which is kind of what happens when you hit that next level, right? Um, and I, I can remember the, the first time I heard about Caitlin Clark, it was her freshman year. We were doing games from studio in Bristol mm -hmm. because yeah. it was, you know, COVID, COVID times. And uh, Sue Bird is my good friend and she was doing some studio work uh, with us and we were name carpooling. Drop. Yeah, name drop. There okay. you go. You we hang were, out with CC Sabathia and Sue Bird. We know. That, that's right. So we we had, these are CC's cleats behind me. Um, we, we had- uh, Think of the value of those, McMahon. Yeah, there you go. We Hey, we McMahon, <laughs> on the other side, there's Emmys. <laughs> no, no, hey, hey. like you know like no, no. He, just, he just sat down they, there you know they, it's no it's no big deal just see these I mean, cleats and emmys hey the coolest are, thing i have is an autograph windy uh trading card <laughs> 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 no but anyway sue we get to the studio and there's games on in the back you guys know how the studio setups are and sue is like have you heard of this freshman from iowa she shoots with range like steph curry mm -hmm. caitlin clark's her name i hadn't heard of her we sit down we're waiting I watch her and I'm watching her shoot. I'm like, oh my gosh. And there's so much amazing about her game and her being magnetic and even the way she loves to defer to her teammates. But at the core of everything is her range. We have not seen someone shoot off the dribble with her range in the women's game ever. We just haven't. And that is what's so captivating. The same way that Curry captivated all of us on the men's side when he did it for the first time, that's what Caitlin has done. And then along those lines, she also has lifted this team to heights they've never been to before at a time where there's more attention than there's ever been on women's sports and mm -hmm. then on her team's run itself as well. So she's, she's amazing. She's handled the pressure so wonderfully. And I do feel like when the light shine brightest, so does she. So I'm curious how you know, this, this entire run goes. Well, you'll be calling it and uh, we will get back to talking about the NBA in just a second. So thank you. I'm, I'm interested in that. I don't care if anybody else was interested. I'm interested <laughs> in it. All right. Welcome back to the hoop collective. Okay. So we've got, uh, you're a baseball guy, part-time uh, yep. Ruko. So we've got an interesting baseball series coming up uh, in the next couple of days that uh, is going to go a long way to determining how the Western conference playoff picture is going to shake out um, Monday night. The, the, the Mavericks uh, have to play the jazz. Is that home or away uh, McMahon? That is in Salt Lake City, but uh, let's be honest. If you're playing the Jazz, you're, you're feeling at home no matter where it is. <laughs> well, Chris Dunn's not going to be playing in that game because he threw a uh, a fist at Jabari Smith uh, over the weekend, and yeah, he suspended. He did. And I like Chris Dunn, but it's the same guy who the game where Luca had the 25 point triple double. Uh, they were called for double T's because Chris Dunn took offense to something, and Luca. Asked the ref, like, what I get a T for? I'm just busting his ass. And then the league, <laughs> the league office says, you know what? Luke had a good point there. They rescinded the technical foul. Point being, I don't think whether Chris Dunn's playing or not is going to have a huge impact. Well, he didn't now. land the punch. You can't throw a punch. I understand that he didn't land the punch and he got two games. I'm just, just for the record, right? That's all. Just, so, just so you know. It's four, I guess. I guess. I, guess. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, he won't be playing in that game. Uh, but then the Mavericks go to Sacramento 
for a um a baseball series two games over three days um or was it four days i think it's four it's, we talked about a that tuesday a few weeks friday ago. baseball so oh, it's, it's gonna be it's a baseball series but you never would have <laughs> yeah that two gap between yeah. baseball games so well, unless it was a uh, lots of days of rain but yeah <laughs> right by the way ruko i know you've had the kings recently um yeah i feel like one of the most and i know that we're in a stat rich time but you know all the smart guys are telling me that there's a conspiracy to keep scoring down. Um, I feel like Demodis Sabonis's uh, double double streak is getting yeah. short shrift. Short shrift. I mean, it's getting mentioned. You know, it's like sort of like a note in every game. And by the way, the number is fifty three, um, which he got after the um, the Kings beat the Magic over the weekend and ended the Magic's five game win streak. Also um, a huge bounce back win for the Kings after they lost to the Capital W Wizards, which is Yeah, they lost more do. than the game. They lost Kevin Herter to a dislocated shoulder in that mm -hmm. game too. So I think it was in that game. Um well no within the last week. And uh that he's gonna be out for a while. So um so 53 straight double doubles for Sabonis. He's got a you know he leads the league in triple doubles uh, as well. But the 53 straight double doubles, I mean, you can have a bad game. You can get in foul trouble. You can have a uh, a scorekeeper that's not in the mood, you know, I'm making a slight joke on that, but still like it's, it's the most double doubles since uh, Kevin love, uh, I think 14 years ago. And the last player to have a longer streak was Elvin Hayes in 73, 74, which was 55, which yeah. he could pass this, you know, could, could slash will pass this week. I, before we even talk about the Kings, I just want to have a moment here, Ruko and acknowledge it's a modest Sabonis having one of the great statistical runs for a single season in NBA history. Yeah, it, it, Bri, you are you're a hundred percent correct, and it has been overlooked. I don't know, guys, if it's because the triple double has become so much more common over the last, you know, since Russ that we overlook double doubles, but. The thing that amazed me, and and you guys reference him all the time, and I love him dearly, Stats Williams, Matt Williams, mm -hmm. who's as valuable as anybody who works at our company and should get paid tenfold whatever he already is, which I hope is wonderful because he's amazing. He, he When he sent the nugget about, about this streak and then that this is, you know, tied for the longest since the merger, and you're like, wait, really? No one's had it longer? That makes you appreciate what DeMontis is doing. And Doris and I did a game a couple of weeks ago there and got a chance to sit down with Domas for a while. And the thing that impressed me, guys, it, one thing in the meeting and then one thing watching him courtside, which obviously I've done other Kings games as well, but it really struck me that night in a win against the Lakers where they swept the season series then, was everything in him, when he's talking about things, it always veers back to winning and being competitive and not not in a lip service way, in a that's the way he was raised to play basketball way. You know, and the way he could talk about the nuances of how his dribble handoff is different with Malik Monk versus the way it is with De'Aaron Fox versus the way it is with Keegan Murray. And how he was able to break down those nuances just shows you his study habits, his passion for those nuances and getting every single ounce out of his game that he can. And then watching him that night and seeing his physicality, I mean, and I know I, I know there are times where he's still maybe a little too small depending on the matchup on the interior, but he is physical, man. And mm -hmm. you 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 feel him sitting courtside there. And I do wonder because of that skill set and the way he facilitates and I think since Jan 1st, he's leading the league in total rebounds and total assists, which is very Jokic-like. You know, I, I do wonder if we aren't having enough curiosity because of the way he struggled in the playoffs last year in that matchup in the first round, if we're not having enough curiosity about what he can be for the Kings this year in the playoffs. Well, I think he's underestimated, and, and I say that as somebody who's been guilty of that. Uh, yeah. And the, it, the lesson I learned there is if you're agreeing with bond temps, really <laughs> reconsider it because, <laughs> you know, listen, we were as critical as anybody 
uh, of the Kings you making too. that deal. You too. Yeah, yeah it, no, I, I mean, f- for once in your life, you were actually right. Uh, for the of my life, I didn't jinx yes, somebody. <laughs> there you go. But obviously, the Pacers are ecstatic about that trade. They got Halliburton in the face of their franchise. But the Kings becoming a relevant NBA franchise again is in large part because of the impact that DeMontis Sabonis is. And, and uh, he is one of the most versatile. So Joker's the only other, only other guy in the conversation in terms of the ability to score, rebound, assist. During this streak, this 50-plus game, uh, double-double streak, he had an eight-rebound game. He just had 13 assists that night. Yeah. And obviously, he's, he's, had a, he's had a ton of uh, triple-doubles during that span. And you know, you, you mentioned the, the physicality. And obviously, you're not going to lead the league in rebounds if you're soft. You know, you got to be you got to be tough. But, dude, watch how he scores. You, you don't, don't be fooled. Like, just because he's not – just dunking on guys, he creates space by being a fullback. I mean, he yeah. is getting his shoulder in there, and that's how he's getting off those little hooks. He, is, I mean, he puts his shoulder in guys' sternums and creates space and bumps big guys back like a couple of feet on a regular basis. Yeah, so it's obviously a huge well, – that's probably one of the reasons why, just in general, the Kings – even though that was a skin tight series to the Warriors last year, the Kings have fought for, I think, some credibility ever since they got the three seed mm-hmm. and then went out in the first round. And, yeah, definitely. Um, but I will say so this is a this is a big week. So the two times they've actually they are two and zero against the Mavericks this year. Um, yeah. I didn't go back and look. I have to assume at least one of those was when Kyrie was out, McMahon. I didn't go back uh, I probably I I can tell you the first game uh live has obviously been great and should be an all rookie uh selection. Uh, he's been great for the Mavericks, but the first game uh that they played the Kings, Sabonis really, you know, took lively to the woodshed and and Sabonis is tough because we just talked about how physical he is, but he's also a guy who he grabs rebounds and and you know brings it up the floor, mm-hmm. pushes it in transition, you know, has has a uh, perimeter skills, especially as a ball handler. And that's something you're not seeing that as a seven foot guy who's a teenager. You're not seeing that on the AAU circuit or in the ACC. So it, it was a little bit different experience. Um, and then I actually looked, obviously Gafford starting for the Mavericks now, him and him and live there, a tag team. And I was like, hmm, I wonder how Gafford fared against, uh, against Sabonis. You know, I, I wondered had they seen each other this season? And they did. Uh, and Sabonis had a 28.13 rebound, 12 assist performance in a, uh, in a Kings win. So, you know, we'll see how that goes, but obviously if, if you're the Mavericks and you're going to win Sacramento, containing Sabonis is pretty high on the priority list. Yeah. So I have the box score here from the first meeting and in fairness, this is in November. Yeah. So Derek Lively is still figuring out which direction the court is when he comes out of the visiting locker rooms, although this game was at home. Sabonis had 32, 13, and 6, and he was 13 of 15 from the field. He took two threes and missed. So that means he was 13 of 13 on twos. Yeah. Um, Lively had six points, nine rebounds. Kyrie did play in that game, but didn't play in the uh, second meeting. Both games were in Dallas. So as we speak here, which is Sunday night, the Kings actually uh, are in seventh. The the uh, Suns had a big win on uh, Saturday, and uh, with all their guys uh, playing well, and so they've edged a half game ahead. Um, but this this you know the Kings or uh, the the Suns as we've talked about have a brutal schedule coming yes. down the stretch. Yeah, it's awful. And toughest look, in the league in terms of uh, opponents winning percentage. By the way, though, the Kings have the third toughest by opponents winning percentage. That's a good point. And so, um, although they have played much better against better teams, like the as Kings, long as they don't, yeah, as long as they yeah, don't have to play the Wizards again. Yeah, right. Well, I, yeah, they, it's, they've, it's hard they've, to, you're, you're right, Ruko. It's hard yeah, to project the Kings. They've been all over the place. Yeah, they have. They, they're one of four teams to lose to the Wizards, Pistons, and Hornets this season. And yet they are also seven and three. That's hard to do when you only play them twice <laughs> in the Western <laughs> yeah. Conference. You, yeah. don't, you don't get four bites yeah. at the apple. Yeah. yeah. And, and and yet they are seven and three against the Nuggets, 
T Wolves and Thunder, the top that's three incredible. teams in the West. Yeah. Now that's a good stat, sir. Hats off. Hey, Hawkins would that's, never come to something like that. That's Matt Williams. That's Matt Williams <laughs> hooking me up. That's stats hooking there me up. Go. But but you know what's interesting, guys, is just, just to button up that point. Talking to them, I do think that has been sort of at the foundation of their confidence of why they can have success in these playoffs, you know, feeling like some of their struggles against lesser opponents during the regular season has been them learning how to handle posterity right after last season and then being encouraged by how they've been able to measure up to the best teams in the league. Yeah. And, and, you know, going into this little uh, two game set with the Mavericks, uh, the Mavericks have been playing. It's weird. They had that stretch of five losses in six games. Outside of that, they've you know, they've been tearing it up. Yeah. Um, and I think because of the strength of the schedule, they are they do have the tiebreaker against uh, the Suns. They'll have to sweep the series and then have it come down a conference record if they were going to get the tiebreaker against the Kings. Sweep the the two games. Two games. Yeah. Say. Um, but I think if the Mavericks, I, yeah, more than the tiebreaker, I think just the opportunity to pick up two games and it's in a real tight race. I mean, right, I think I'm just saying just pure tiebreakers. But I think right. if they split, if the Mavericks split in Sacramento, I think they'd leave there feeling pretty good about their chances to uh, climb out Pass of the them. And, and claim uh, the the six seed. Especially since this first game is on the second night of a back to back, where the Kings are going to have two days off. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and I, you know, um, I tell you, we, you talk about the Kings, you start with Sabonis and obviously De'Aaron Fox. They're, they're two guys, they weren't all stars this year, but they're absolutely all star caliber players. And then, you know, we'll get, you can talk about Keegan Murray, Malik Monk, six man of the year. You know who has become an absolute huge key for the Sacramento Kings? Keon Ellis. Yes. Yes. And a lot of people are listening right now going, who? A guy who was on a two-way deal, played himself into a, a standard contract. Kevin Herter's out now, as, as Wendy mentioned, with his shoulder. Uh, he's he's in the starting line. And you know what? If people know who Keon Ellis is outside of Sacramento, they probably are, oh, that's the guy who got fooled by Brunson pointed at a screen that wasn't <laughs> coming and, and yeah, got made to look that's silly. That's unfortunately been his biggest play yeah. highlight this year. But, dude, this guy, he has been playing, and he doesn't put up huge numbers. He had a great game against uh, Orlando. I think he had 19, a career-high 19, but he's been in the starting line. They're 8-1 and one this year with him in the starting lineup. That's kind of a wonky stat because it's over a couple different little spans, but – uh, I think that he's going to have to continue to play really, really well, not necessarily score a lot, but like I assume he's probably going to, I assume Keegan Murray is probably going to be the primary defender on Luka and Keon Ellis will get Kyrie. So I, you know, that, that's a guy who, if the Kings are going to uh, come out of this mix atop the six to eight pile, I think he's going to be a big, big part of it, despite being a relative no name. Speaking of awards, um, I was noticing in some stats because uh, the De De'Aaron Fox, who, by the way, had the two games that they, they played against the Mavs this year. He had big games both nights. I think he scored over 30 both nights. Um, obviously, he was the inaugural um, clutch player, uh, Jerry West Award last year. And there's kind of been a thought, well, he can't repeat. Um, but he had 12 points in the fourth quarter of that win over the Magic, which was a two-point win. And he has the most 10 plus point over 10 or more point fourth quarters in the NBA this season with 22. Um, you're the cojones factor analyst there, McMahon. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where you handicap, you know, he may not be having as good of a year as he was last year, but this is still a guy who in the end of a close game can get it done for you. Yeah. I think that if it's going to be a Californian, we're going to go in uh, San Francisco's West of Sacramento. I, right. I suck at geography. South and West. Yeah. There you go. I think I think well, it would did be that Steph. really quickly. Yeah, I Brian. think it'd be Steph Curry. Yeah, he, he knows. He's he's made yeah. that trip. Um, <laughs> if you ask me, who you got to go south on I five. I mean, that, that's you know that's oh, key. There you go. If you ask me, who the front runner is right now, it's going to be Demar Derozan. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It you is know, interesting though, because isn't I, I think I think Fox is still leading the league in. Points per game in the fourth quarter, right? Points per fourth quarter. Yeah, fourth quarter. Sure. Clutch, yeah, clutch points. 
I'd have to look it up real quick to be 100% sure, but Curry had yeah. the lead, lead last time I looked, just yeah. clutch points, not fourth they've quarter. Been, and they've been in so many clutch yeah. games. The, the right. And the then, uh, and same with same with the Bulls. They either get yep. blown out or it's down to the wire. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, DeMar DeRozan was right there. And then, DeRo- like, the, the tighter you get, like, one possession game within three minutes, within one minute, yeah. last 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, you can draw like, the DeRozan, boxes. DeRozan ways. blows yeah. it away in all Separates, those categories. Yeah. 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 So, well, yeah. I think, look, Aaron Fox is obviously one of the best closers in the league. Um, i tell you what, though, Ruko could tell you <laughs> Kyrie, <laughs> Kyrie and Luke aren't bad in those situations either. So, oh, no, they, well, they are not. Th- that's the thing with last year, right? Last year, when they first got there, they kept screwing up. They couldn't win a close game, right? And now 100%. it's the opposite. Yeah, and, and it was never it was never like a uh, – it, w- it wasn't like they were having a wrestling match for the ball. Yeah, they were they were guilty of not want to step on each other's toes and deferring too much. Like the most memorable Kyrie Luca moment from last season's, you know, failure that landed them in the lottery was when they're passing the ball back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, game on the line against the Wolves until they cough it up and it's a, and it's a turnover. Mm-hmm. Where this year. They they both had a uh, they both had great clutch numbers. They're playing off of each other. The the chemistry and the chemistry from a personal standpoint had n- it was never an issue. Just kind of learning how to play off each other. You know that's taken off this year, and they've been surrounded by better fits. Um, you know they they don't have Christian Wood uh, closing games with them. I, yeah. you know, they, so it's always a it, special moment when Chris Wood gets mentioned by McMahon on this podcast. Right <laughs> I'm glad I was here to witness it. I, you know, it's they're they're good. You know, we talk a lot about scary teams and 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 the West and and of course, so much of that focus has been on the Lakers and Warriors. And if they emerge, of all those teams, Dallas is the one that if I was one of those top teams in the West, I would be very concerned with. And, you know, the main reason, obviously, is because Luka is a bad man. And yeah. and and then Kyrie, as we all know, when he's able to slot into really being your shooting guard, that is when he is at his best. And we saw it in the 2021 season with Harden. Kyrie had an unbelievable year, 50, 40, 90. If Giannis doesn't slide under his ankle in the conference finals, he and KD are probably getting the Nets to, I mean, in the Eastern Conference semis, they're probably getting the Nets to the conference finals, even with Harden hurt. Uh, that's how good he had been throughout that season. But when you slot him off off the ball like that, he's, mm-hmm. just, he's just so, so good and dynamic and efficient. And we've seen that throughout. Plus, we know he has no fear taking any kind of big shot. And then, you know, you look at a couple things with Dallas. One, the way they've been getting easy baskets. First of all, one thing that I marvel at any time I, I watch Luca is just how easily he scores. Because everybody is always kind of in between. Is he going to pass? Is he not going to pass? Oh, wait, he's just going to lay it in. And, and he just gets easy buckets. The numbers, though, since Feb 10th, since they made those trades, it's crazy. They went from, I think... 26th or 28th in layups and dunks per game to seventh. And they're, yeah. they're shooting those shots that more efficient than anybody. And then you look at some of their lineup combos, their starting lineup, you know, they're starting five since Jones moved in uh, with, with Washington Gafford, Kyrie and Luca. They're absolutely bludgeoning teams over 80 minutes. I think they're like a net 28 to outscoring opponents by 28 points per 100 possessions in those 80 minutes. Add in the lineups with Exum, which you know Jason Kidd absolutely loves, and he's been really good with Luca and and Kyrie. They're they're interesting because they have some different levers they can pull in a series and in and in a matchup. And I'm curious to see how that plays out against Sacramento in, in two games that'll feel a little bit like a series. Do you go with Gafford? Do you go with Lively? What kind of minutes does Exum get? Uh, how much do you have to play Tim Hardaway Jr., if at all? You know, all these things are, mm-hmm. are going to be interesting to to watch. Yeah, and, and at high this sticks. point, I'd... go on, Wendy, sorry. High stakes. Yeah, it is high stakes. And at, at this point, they have settled into a starting lineup um, where, you know, and they, they went to it right after that stretch where they lost five out of six, where you got Jones starting at, at – 
whatever you call it, small forward. He he's starting as the one through four. He's guarding the best player, and then Gafford starting at the five, a tag team with Gafford and Lively. And then the the, the question with centers really, do they give Maxi Kleba minutes at at the five? Mm-hmm. He'll play some at the four regardless. Does he get minutes at the five? Do they kind of play that small ball five out style with him, or do they just go with the rim runners uh, the whole forty eight minutes? Um, and, and some bonuses, it'll be interesting to see how that goes against a bonus because he's, again, if, if Lively and Gaff, the, the weakness with Lively and Gafford is if you can pull them out and make them guard on the perimeter, you, you can create some problems. And then the big question with the Mavericks, as far as ceiling goes, is still, is That's- this, yeah, is, is this team good enough uh, defensively? You know, they're, they're, they're going to scare people, but are they good enough defense? So the Boston Celtics won their ninth consecutive game over the Chicago Bulls over the weekend. Um, they're in, you know, great position to clinch the number one seed in the East here within the next week or so. Um, and I know that uh, living on the East Coast, you get quite a few of their games. We've got a few of them on the network, Ryan. Mm-hmm, uh, just a few. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that you were talking about is just how – you see differences in this year's team to last year's team more than just the fact that they've got Chris Epps, Porzingis. And uh, we've looked at a lot of, about them and, and, and their stars, but really materially they are different. And I think that's something you've noticed working them up close quite a few times this season. Yeah, I, Brian, I, I have. Like, I, I feel like they are hampered with a little bit of the okay – Let's see what they do in the playoffs narrative, right? And it's not, I don't even think it's with the spirit of, because regular season success doesn't matter for them at this point, like it's a championship or bust, which would be fair, right? It would be fair to say the only success for the Boston Celtics this season is a championship. Anything else is going to feel like a failure for them. I think that's fair to say. But when people say it, I think they say it almost through the vein of, because, you know, they haven't been able to win the big one, you know, because they haven't. And I act, I don't buy into that. I think, I think a couple years ago, right. When they, when they, you know, probably were the better team in those finals and, and, and should have, could have won that championship against the Warriors, which that championship for the Warriors were forever be just an epic, epic title for them. You know, that, that wasn't necessarily the expectation for everybody that season, right? And then because of what happened last year, they've gotten saddled with this narrative, but they're not far removed from a team that felt like it was crescendoing, and they have massive differences this season that really apply to the playoffs. And, of course, Porzingis is a huge part of it because – they didn't have we, what what did we see guys we saw the crunch time offense constantly let them down well now they have the most efficient play in basketball this season is a Kristaps Porzingis post up by points per possession that wasn't in the bag obviously before this year they also added Drew Holiday who we know has been a key 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 contributor with massive winning plays on a championship team mm-hmm. but I also think something that doesn't get talked about enough is Marcus Smart not being there. And that's this isn't this isn't to knock Marcus, but Marcus Smart not being there has also allowed Derek White to flourish. Yeah. I think it's allowed Tatum and Brown also in their games and personality wise to continue to evolve and grow. And you're seeing them, I think, is the best versions of themselves when it comes to being cogs in a team and 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 playmaking and picking their spots and doing what the game asks of them. And to me, the only thing that's keeping us from talking about the Celtics as this unbelievably dominant, historically good team, which right now, you know, their net rating, their plus 12, which is the best in the play-by-play era, which only goes back to 96, 97, but, you know, that's still a, a decent chunk of time is the fact that they, you know, last year they, they got beat by the heat, right? Like uh, other than that, I, I, it's hard for me. And I've watched them up close. I've had many Celtics games this year. It's not, it's not even close how much better they have been in this regular season than every other team in the NBA. Now 
Are you going to give respect to Denver? Because we know they've done it, and we know the Murray-Jokic two-man game is the most unstoppable force at the end of a game in the NBA. But I still think people are underselling how good this Celtics team is, and if they run through the playoffs and never see a seventh game and win a title, I think we're going to look back on it and say, huh, you know, we were kind of assigning a previous roster's there is shortcomings no way to this. <laughs> as a veteran of about six, seven-game Celtic series in the last three years, <laughs> you, there's no way many of them game exasperated seven? as I book Game 7 instead of going home. Sorry, I want to make it about myself, <laughs> but... I will believe that when I say I'm not. I'm not I don't take any uh, offense to of what you. Hold on, but aren't, you just said. You, you're going to be on the West. You're going to be on I the West finals this year, right? It, so be. maybe I, if they can just get rid of you, they can close out a series a little bit quicker. Seem to end up booking a last minute flight to Boston. Oh man, Brian, you, know, you you think you think that they're fully healthy? You think they're going to see a seventh game in an Eastern Conference series? They shouldn't, but I've seen it. Series after series after series. I but isn't feel that like, kind of but isn't that kind of my point? My point is you've seen it, but you haven't seen it. Well, here's with what I, this here, team. Here's one thing that we haven't talked about. Obviously, the frontline guys get talked about a lot. Two things I'll talk about. One, Derek White, when you talk to folks around the Celtics, Derek White's got the second best plus minus on the on the roster behind Jason Tatum. Derek White's having a spectacular season. And he is, um, since the All-Star break, I don't have his numbers right in front of me, his shooting splits are like spectacular. Yeah, He already is one of the best offensive uh, perimeter players in the league, one of the best in the league at shot blocking I mean, he's at a guard. But he's shooting the ball great. That's one thing. Second thing is they got some, you know, people say that their bench is short. Yeah, I guess because they're not proven. Sam Hauser is having a spectacular year. That's a guy who... If you're not a Celtics fan, you may not be that familiar with him, but I suspect if you watch the playoffs this year, he's going to announce himself. He's shooting 44% on threes with like averaging five or six attempts a game. He's had a couple of huge games in the last couple of, in the last couple of weeks, despite having a bad ankle injury, which he got overcome. And Peyton Pritchard, a guy who was, I don't know if he was unplayable. He just wasn't a guy that Joe Mazzullo mm -hmm. ever went to. This was a guy who was a key member of their uh, rotation a couple of years ago. It was kind of a surprise last fall when they gave him a contract extension. It was like, really? And he has been a a real contributor. Yep. Like he distributes the ball. He doesn't just shoot. He's shooting it okay, shooting 39%, which is obviously above average. He shot a little better earlier in his career. He was a killer shooter at Oregon uh, in his college career. But um, he he sets guys up. Like he's making defensive plays. Like, Offensive rebounding despite his size, too. He yeah. gets rebounds. I don't want to say like he's a great rebounder because he's not, but like he comes out of there with, with balls. So yeah. I do think that's a that's an interesting factor. On the on the Derek White thing, it's interesting, you know, McMahon. At the end of this season, Derek White um is eligible because it's based on his current contract. He's got one year left. He's eligible to go for four years and 122 million, I think. Um, and I've been debating with people about whether or not that would be like, I think they should absolutely get him signed. Um, but like his quote unquote max, yeah, you know, that's a funky word. Right. Is, I think four and 122. Uh, so about 26, no, that's not right. 28 or something like that. You are so um, bad at math. It's, it's I, a little over 30. It's over 30. It's, it's 30, <laughs> 30, 30, 30.5. No, but Kent, I think Kent State folks. No, I it's I don't know. St. Vincent and St. Mary. Yeah, well, I was definitely not a good math student. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna Does I'm your gonna iPhone to you not have a calculator on it? <laughs> I, I you know <laughs> well, I, well, it's it's it's, it's, it's thirty if it's one twenty two over four, it's thirty point five. Did you it get might be like one twenty two over iPhone without a calculator? What's going uh, on? Hold on. I'm I, I, uh, anyway, okay, four for 122. Yeah. 30.5 mil, that's the average. <laughs> okay, thank you, <laughs> just verifying that. All right, do we think he's a $30 million player? And, or, you know. Yeah, I, because I, don't talk to me about numbers, talk to me about impact on winning. And he is a critical, critical part of a team that's going to win 
what, five, 66 games? Yeah. That's what the, as the cap continues to rise, because, and, you know, I don't know what the, what the starting number will be, but it's not going to be 30 next season. The, the cap will continue to rise. Now, he's under contract for next season. Right. So, so it won't be 30 in, the, uh, in a couple of years. You know, and look, the, the, it, to me, the question's not, is he a $30 million a year player? It's when you start looking at it because obviously Jalen Brown just got what will temporary or what is for now, but will not be the summer, the, the biggest contract in NBA history. And by the way, he's had a great year. Yep. Um, Jason Tatum's about to get <laughs> an even bigger, biggest contract. Yeah, so the numbers according to Bobby, I know it was reported as going to be over $300 million for Jalen Brown, but ended up being 288 once all the everything was mm-hmm. calculated, and Tatum is eligible for three hundred four. So Tatum, assuming he gets the super max, which he's already qualified for it, yeah, will be the first three hundred million dollar player. And Jokic is third, like or second now, but Jokic had some two eighty something like that, two seventy five. So right, uh, you know they, they've got the Drew Holiday contract yeah. thing. As a, as, a, as an aside, you brought that up. So Drew Holiday, by the way, he is eligible on April first. To he's already eligible now, but he gets <laughs> this sounds funky. He gets more eligible mm-hmm. April 1st. There's, there's there's fewer limits on what he can sign on April 1st. And I do think that there's interest on both sides to get something done um sooner rather than later, whether they do or not. I don't know. Yeah, obviously um, they extended Porzingis quickly after the trade. So I guess the w- what I'm saying is the question is not is Derek White a 30 million dollar player? It's given the luxury tax that the Celtics are looking at pay because he wouldn't be a thirty million dollar player as far as you know their actual payroll is concerned. He'd be a thirty million times you know x square g y z whatever. Now you've totally lost me. You know my point is it would cost the Celtics a hell of a lot more than thirty million dollars a year to have him. So that's a that's a Celtics ownership. How much are you willing to pay to keep what is right now the best team in the NBA together? And yeah, that this, that's the question. Not as he, not as he impactful enough to he, pay thirty mil. You, you know what's interesting about it though, guys. Too like we talk about his defense and and like you were talking about Brian and and and, and it's incredible. This is a little bit um, as you guys know and can tell. Like I do love the analytics and and how they can support you know especially some of the things that that go maybe undervalued. Mm-hmm. Derek Derek White is top five in pick and roll efficiency as a ball handler. And I, last yeah. Celtics game I did, talking to Joe Mazzulla about White, who, he, I mean, as you know, and, and anyone could imagine, Joe just absolutely loves Derek White, and any coach would. He, he, he said, watch us. If we need a bucket, we go to a, we go to a Derek White pick and roll on the right side. That's what we go to. So this is a guy who's not only just, you know, perfect in his role, but he's a guy who's expanded his game in a way in which he, he continues to provide an impact, even as he's being asked to do more and more. It's hard. I know that you're right, Tim. Like, the, I mean, it's going to, if they keep this roster together, it's going to end up costing them a ton of money. It is hard for me to imagine them drawing up a scenario where Derek White is not a, a, a part of their future. Yeah. And and listen, nobody's crying for the old and it, this ain't some small market. Oh, how are they gonna they well, sell they they do have tickets, big TV deal, that's all true. those kind of things. That's true. But by comparison, their ownership group isn't as deep pocketed as some of the others. But I will say they do have so so Tatum's extension would kick in after next season. Derek White's extension would kick in after next season. Mm-hmm. Um, Drew Holiday actually has a player option next year for $39 million, which depending on how they negotiate, he could decline. And I don't want to assume what they're going to do. My guess maybe lower that number down a little bit and then push. He's 33. Give him they years. Could give him, they could give him up to four years. Their Celtics aren't facing severe tax and – apron challenges until the year after next. So this group I think is going to be, you know, again, assuming they get holiday locked up, Porzingis already signed his extension earlier this uh, season. 
this group, I think, will largely be brought back. They already extended Peyton Pritchard. Would not surprise me if they try to get something done with Sam Hauser as well. Um, they have a window here of this season and next before they have to make what I think will be hard decisions. And then they might, I mean, ultimately there's nothing that says that they can't keep all these guys, just right. tax penalties and, and, uh, and apron issues. But the really good thing about the Celtics is even though they've made some big trades to get Derek white, to get drew holiday, to get Krebs Ops Porzingis, they haven't really super mortgaged their future. They owe, they owe a couple first, but they're in decent shape with first round picks. Like they can still draft a little bit and they can still even make another trade giving first round picks. They this, aren't like heavily mortgaged. This is such a windy conversation though. And, and and I love it because you are the king of looking at the NBA and you understand the business of the game so well. You understand the business of oh, player you, personnel thank you. Of running a front office. And sometimes you forget the games are fun. Let these let these dudes go on. <laughs> let's see if they can go on a damn championship run before you have people in Boston worrying about 2025, well, 26. Well, I, I'm not. I'm just saying, like, you know, they have to make decisions on Derek White and Drew Holiday in the next few months. No, this is what, no, what they have to do, what they have to do the next couple months is win a damn NBA championship. All right. Well, you can That's watch what, you can watch the Boston Celtics a lot on ESPN in the next few weeks, and Ryan but, Rick will be on the call. But All right. you know, we're, hey, we're getting we're though. getting late here. We're getting late. But no, you you talked about you started this talking about the the pressure on them because they haven't done it, they haven't done it, they haven't done it. But you get enough at bats, you're going to hit a home run. Uh, you know, if, if you're a you know if you've got a, a a big swing, and you look at like Tatum and I, you know LeBron. Now you're and, talking uh, about the Yankees, right? Yeah, <laughs> LeBron, do that and, LeBron, and, and and JD Redick on their podcast brought this up. Tatum's 26 years old, has played in four conference finals, and, and one of those times got to the finals. When a guy is going that far consistently, and it's not just – look, obviously he, he got to a team that was ready to contend right away, but he's been a featured attraction from his rookie year on, mm-hmm. a huge a huge part of those teams. When a guy is going that deep in the playoffs year after year after year after year – and they've got the supporting cast around them. They've upgraded. They're going to break through eventually, and there's going to be a ton of pressure until they do. And then, I, you know, I nowhere think it, is it written that they must break through. Well, but in general, I know what you're saying, and I agree. Right. But nowhere and then, is what, it and then, and then, and and then, once they do, like if if it happens this year, it's going to be recognized as you know what this actually was one of the best teams of and that's what race. ryan is saying what ryan is saying is exactly. he's traveled he's traveled from knoxville to lawrence to sacramento <laughs> and back i don't know if you've been to lawrence i know you've been to knoxville because i text you one day yes um not lawrence but knoxville yes and, okay. and and brian this is the best team i have seen since the kd warriors N- now the I look Denver's incredible. And would I be surprised if the Nuggets repeat? No. But as of this moment, what I've seen this regular season and watching these teams, Boston without question is the best team I've seen since the KD Warriors. And that's why uh Brad Stevens will probably win executive of the year. As he should. Hey, Ryan Rucco, thanks for uh coming on uh for your first time. We'll definitely have you back when your schedule permits, which is rare. Hey, I, I appreciate you guys having me. This has been a blast. I, I'm not just saying it. I listen to every episode. You guys record. A well, now lot. there's no mystery. You're going to know what we said. Yeah, no, that's it. I, I, I but I'll, st- uh, you know, I, I'll, I will still listen back. But I appreciate you guys record so often that whenever I'm, you know, I, I three times a week I get my, I get my updated episode. So I, I, I love it. And thank you guys for being so kind and, and welcoming. Well, hey, we wish you far, luck. Call- I, by far, my favorite New Yorker that we've ever had on this podcast. <laughs> All right. All, All right. right. I don't find any anything wrong with that. And uh, good luck with those Nets games down the stretch, Ryan. It's, oh, gosh. Uh, it's a heavy lift. Uh, All heavy I can lift. say is thank God for my partner, Sarah Kustak, who I absolutely love working with because um, – we are having to flex uh, broadcast muscles that no broadcaster wants to have to flex. <laughs> well, thanks for flexing your podcast muscles and joining us. Thank you. you. Got it. Thank you to Jackson, our producer. Thank you for watching, listening to the Hoop Collective podcast. We'll talk to you soon. I didn't get a thank you, but that's okay. Oh, and thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, McMahon. <laughs> 
I didn't mean it, McMahon. I was just getting out of the way so that you could deliver your sign off. Adios, amigos.